Today I'm joined by with Vincent by, uh, from uh, Tribuchet. How's it going, Vincent? Hi, Philip. It's going great. How about you? <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. It's it's pretty cold today, and uh, I had a, a very uh, unpleasant surprise. Um, I had no idea because I didn't go outside yesterday, and uh, they were clearing the streets, so I had to move my car. And uh, oh. luckily for me, it, it started, but uh, it was, I, you know, I almost got <laughs> caught with a, a towing fee. But uh, all good aside that. Um, uh, what about you? What on, on your side? What's cooking? Uh, quite a lot. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm working a lot these days. Uh, the, the pandemic hasn't uh, hit us too hard, uh, adapting to remote working. And now we're uh, working on the shipping our latest game uh, in the following months. So yeah, in the last stages of this is uh, very exciting, but also a bit demanding, I'd have to say. Cool. Yeah, well, thanks for the honesty, man. I hear you. I hear you. Um, <laughs> so we'll talk about that game uh, a little bit later. But uh, first, just like going in sort of the Vincent story. Um, where did you grow up uh, in Quebec? I grew up uh... Technically, uh, I was uh, growing up uh, in Varennes. It's okay. on the south shore of Montreal, like about a 30 minute drive to like uh, the city. Yeah. And uh, but I was like uh, very closer to the city of Verchar, which is like my uh, my heart belongs to Verchar uh, in that area because of like uh, it's a very very beautiful uh, small city. And uh, yeah. I was living in the country, like in between those two cities, so I got to choose. <laughs> Nice, nice. You, you chose your identity then. <laughs> That's pretty <cool>. Yes. <laughs> um, I know you have like a lot of interest in filmography and cinema. Um, was there a particular moment in your childhood where you were like, man, movies are, are the best? Like, was there a specific movie or was there like just your interest grew over time? Like, how did that happen? I feel like... Uh... There wasn't as I kind of decided to go into cinema uh, later on uh, in my teenage years. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like cinema was kind of always present uh, when I was growing up, like moving, watching movies and renting movies, like with the parents and my brothers. And like uh, one thing we did uh, is uh, we had like a family cam recorder, like a video, uh, old school yeah. uh, video recorder, and uh, big ones. playing a lot uh, with the. We did lots of uh, home movies of like. Uh, I did a lot of stop motion animation films with my Legos and this sort wow. of stuff uh, when I was a kid. Okay. And I kind of really like to build those stories with my toys. So like uh, later on when I had to choose a car career, I thought, oh yeah, I seem to have a good fit there, but I kind of uh, decided uh, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I had no idea you did stop motion. That's a, it, It's not, it, it's a very time consuming uh, thing to do stop motion. It's not uh it's not yeah, as yeah. easy as it's just shoot and film. Um, did you ever find it too time consuming or you were like, this uh, is the shit? No, no. I I, I, I mean, I, I was like 10 years old and I was playing with my, I built, I built like, a, let's say a dock with uh, my Legos and like moving the characters along the, the side. And like nice. every time they had to talk to each other, I couldn't do stop motion because I had to talk beside the cam recorder so like everything stopped when people were doing dialogue but like yeah, technically yeah i mean it was just a fun thing to do as a kid yeah that's really cool um and so you know uh moving on you i think you uh you enroll at concordia university in i think you majored in film production i think this was what uh, 2008 2009 thereabouts yes yes um, i went straight from like my high school to like CEGEP to okay. which I chose to go in cinema. And then I was luckily accepted in the Concordia in film production. Okay. Uh, I was accepted by submitting an experimental film I did, uh, which was for me, it was like a parody of experimental films because okay. like uh, we had this uh, in our CEGEP cinema class, they had like this one moment when they said, okay, now you're gonna all have to do an experimental film. And we did something that was way over the top and uh, too much like uh, at some point i drank a glass of water and i like threw up dirt uh, so like <laughs> it, it, it was uh, there were no meaning whatsoever to anything like but and uh, i got accepted with that film basically <laughs> and, uh, okay, okay. So they yeah. this they saw your absurdity side uh, to to it all and it and it really it had a good dramatic. I, I'm effect. not sure. I think maybe they thought I was being serious with the thing, but like because there's a lot of uh, this uh, 
I'd say it, at Concordia, a lot of the students in cinema there are a lot more towards like uh, creation and being like artists uh, themselves. Like uh, whereas other programs and other film schools, uh, there was the uh, UCAM uh, film school, which is more like about the technique and like fitting into the production of like what is cinema in Quebec afterwards, I feel. So like uh, okay. to them, I was like, oh, this is like an artist who has something to say. And I mean, it, not, it wasn't technically false, but like uh, I was kind of <laughs> goofing around more or, more or less. <laughs> okay. And, you know, were there yeah, a lot of programs in university, the reason a lot of people go to university, you know, even business school or whatever, is the networking opportunities. Do you feel that you had that at Concordia? <laughs> Uh, yes, I I feel like I had that, uh, and I feel like it's maybe the most important thing that uh, I I learned and uh, I I managed to like that was granted to me through my mm -hmm. studies, uh, and but I I wasn't going in that process. I thought like oh, I'm going and gonna learn this craft and try to get a job afterwards or make myself a job, but I wasn't. Uh, thinking that much as an entrepreneur back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, my main uh, focus when I finished my degree was like, I really, really don't want to work in a coffee shop and like <laughs> struggle for like five years before getting to make a short yeah. film. Like, uh, cause it's a very hard, uh, yeah. if you really want to make the films themselves, like there, there's not a way to, and there's no easy way to like get the funding and you have to apply to uh, grants and uh, yeah. financing this sort of stuff so uh, i wanted to focus in learn a craft and i specialized in uh, video editing that's kind of like going back to like doing the stop motion films like i i ended up like i in the high school in my teenage years mm -hmm. i continued doing like films for fun but then i edited on my computer and like so i had this continuity and yeah. like coming back to uh, your question is like the contacts i made uh, made and the networking was very important and we ended up uh, founding a, a film production co-op with uh, uh, some of the students with whom i became friends over the years so nice. i wouldn't have never done that without having this kind of support and community around me at the time Okay, so that's that's the co-op uh, on exists that you, you ended up working for. Uh, I think I guess during the university and afterwards, um, did you yeah. did you work on a lot of projects? Were there like was there a project in particular that you're like this was like super fun? Um, um, what? Yeah, I, mean, I I did like kind of two things because, like I said, like I my main worry was to be able to get paid for what I was doing. So like right. in the co-op itself, I kind of. Uh, focused in trying to get like corporate video production gigs this sort of stuff and like right. to try and build a system toward like getting contracts in and like paying everybody and like doing the stuff mm -hmm. uh, so i didn't really do that much creative projects then and that's kind of like uh, something that felt like uh, a disappointment to me but there was a uh, one project we did is like year after year we we kind of did we started doing like this sort of a manifesto event, like where we, everybody in the co-op would kind of make a film trying to like show his take on the cinema or whatever he wanted to do. And like okay. one year that turned into like a, a VJ, VJing event, whereas like oh, you wow. mix a video footage yeah. live with music. So like yep. we paired every uh, filmmaker with a, a DJ that DJ, they wanted yeah. to sign up. And like I did the, a one hour set uh, focusing on the uh, remashing uh, scenes from the movie Slapshot. I don't know if you've ever seen Slapshot. <laughs> yes, yes, I've seen Slapshot. Yeah. I'm kidding. And I, Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, uh, but I did like, uh, you know, short loops where like if somebody were giving a punch, like yeah. it would be like a, a looping gift. So like they looked like they were dancing. So I, uh, and That's I awesome. kind of uh, made things uh, move with the music and effects and everything. It was very. Uh, that's maybe my favorite project I did. Yeah, that's that's really cool. That's really really cool. Um, and I guess after, or it was during that time frame, a little bit later, that then you sort of um, you enrolled at University of Montreal in um, in a um, I guess it's a small degree for video game production. Um, did you feel like that that was the right time to get into the gaming industry? Because I knew you had interest in in video games before, but. Uh, 
I guess, what, what sparked your interest of making a career out of it at this point? I feel like uh, what got me moving in that direction is really the fact that I, it, in a continuity of like what I did at Only This is like, I realized I wasn't like, I luckily, I never had to do like a, a coffee, uh, get my work in a coffee shop or whatever. And like, mm -hmm. I managed to be like a, a film editor for TV. Mm -hmm. And I was working on things like uh, on the uh, Canal Evasion, there was this uh, thing called Villa de Rêve, which is like okay. uh, dreams of big houses, basically. Yeah. And like, uh, I was a uh, editor on that. And like, I kind of did it like I was like, yeah, I'm uh, I'm earning my, my wages and like I'm working and everything. But I realized I studied in cinema mm. at the same time to be creative myself and i didn't feel like i was like uh getting that part of my life uh, uh feeded like uh, and mm -hmm. the thing is like i thought okay now i should make a film i guess like I, i've stabilized financially i should make a film and i mm -hmm. thought i really don't want to make a film i want to make games <laughs> so so at that time i thought <laughs> okay so i'm not at the right place <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I had the fear of like being a, an imposter, uh, you know, the imposter syndrome. Like I could yeah, technically yeah. at that point, I've just applied at the big studios like Ubisoft and whatever. And uh, maybe they would have been interested since I had experience in the like cinema in the game industry are kind of uh, not similar, but related in a way. Yeah, they are. And yeah, like, yeah, very much so. Uh, but uh, having uh, the fear of like not belonging or like being kind of like unproductive as a, I wanted to make sure I could bring something to the table for whatever company hired me. Mm -hmm. So I did the study at the university of Montreal and I liked the fact that it was like one year intensive program. Uh, and I kind of uh, also at that point in my life, I decided like, uh, you know, I kind of always had an easy time with like uh, getting good grades and like uh, never really working that much. And uh, and I thought, if I'm gonna fail at this, I I won't. I have to give a hundred percent. Like right. uh, I I won't give myself the excuse of like, well, I partied and didn't study. Like that's mm -hmm. why I failed on that test or whatever. Mm -hmm. I thought I I I was like growing up as a person and living in my adult life for a while longer at that point and i was starting to feel the responsibilities and i thought if i'm doing a career change yeah i need to do it seriously and dedicate myself to it and uh, okay. so i stopped doing uh, every people that uh, hired me for like doing tvs and uh, ed editing i said i'm not available anymore so like uh, i didn't do any contracts after that i was just a hundred percent full-time student leading toward the uh, I wanted to be like a game designer uh, mm -hmm. at that point. Um, I know from our past conversations, you've participated in a lot of like uh, game jams and, and that kind of stuff where, you know, you, you guys have like pizzas and bagels and, and you just work like incessantly for hours with no sleep and lots of caffeine. Um, is that, you know, the conditions in which the idea for Trebuchet came by or did you meet them more at school and it was just... It was much more conventional. <laughs> uh, no, it's a bit of both, I guess. Like okay. uh, because we did a lot of uh, game jams during our studies. Okay. Uh, it was very much encouraged by teachers, and luckily so because it's true that it's a good way to like uh, break break the ice and like not fear of like not doing what you're supposed to be doing, and like mm -hmm. this imposter syndrome kind of just has to go away at that point. Mm -hmm. And doing the game jams. Uh, like you said, uh, like you kind of do it in, intensely for 48 hours. So like there's a silliness to like how you interact with others. And like, that's a good way to uh, build friendships. Yeah. That's and that's right. uh, where I, I kind of got closer to uh, two of my uh, former camarades uh, de class, uh, uh, which were uh, Guillaume and Alexandre, with uh, okay. whom we uh, founded Tribuchet as soon as we finished school uh, after the first year. Nice. And um, okay, a lot of questions about Trebuchet, but first the name. Um, was it for the memes or for Age of Empires Two, or was it? A little bit <laughs> it's a bit of both, really. And like, <laughs> uh, I'm not even sure. I'd have to check, but I think if you went on the, I, I'll just 
look really it's there's the tribuchet website if you yeah. did tribuchet.fun slash tribuchet yeah there was a gif from a uh, no it's not up anymore uh, because we had like a, a gif of like uh, the age of empire 2 tribuchet like coming in okay. the screen and like moving around and like uh, <laughs> yeah but yes we were fans of uh, at that point we were really fan of the memes okay. uh and working uh not working playing age of empire 2 is kind of I feel like in, in every gamer's past, some at some point, somebody played Age of Empire 2. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and uh, the memes were something that we felt was very funny. And, like, the thing is, like, uh, the idea of the name kind of came from my girlfriend, uh, Claude, mm -hmm. when she said to me, like, I always liked the word trebuchet. And she was thinking about the like fonts and like uh, Microsoft Word. <laughs> she, like, she was you know, thinking of fonts. That's <laughs> yeah, hilarious. She was thinking of fonts and she said, like, there's. And I was like, it's not for that reason, but, <laughs> but we'll I take it. It, <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. All right, but, cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. And did you, from the get go, did you, did you think we should focus on VR or was that something that came further down yes. the road? No, we, I, from the get-go, the thing is like, uh, I doing my uh, DS, DSS uh, class, uh, kind yeah. of the master's study, like uh, I bought myself an HTC Vive uh, in 2016. Like uh, yeah. I pre-ordered it in the winter and like it arrived in May <laughs> just before I started my classes. And like, okay. uh, and then I played some games and I really was interested in like what this new medium could like bring. Uh, mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, it's really something like it's very nice. But I thought a lot of the games uh, were more like prototypes or felt more like prototypes. And some were really like not not necessarily garbage, but like I saw games that were branded as like VR baseball. And it's basically what you would think. Like uh, yeah. it seems like a mashup of assets from the asset store where you would hold the bat and bat at balls. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, and I saw on Steam Spy that those games did like something like uh, 10,000 sales estimated. Like at that point, Steam Spy were still giving uh, relevant numbers. It was before uh, they had the, the issue with the Steam API. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought this game is sold for like 10 bucks and they sold 10,000 copies. I could make a hundred grand by doing like a prototype uh, in two months and ship it and make a hundred grand. That's a lot of money. Like, uh, so I thought there's a hole in that medium for like just games are being, uh, are making money when they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the end, we never made those type of prototypes. Like mm -hmm. uh, we ended up wanting to, I, innovate and like uh, make really like real experiences real games uh, but it was in that uh, the way we saw the market and how the games were being put on steam and like uh, we thought maybe there's an opportunity for us and at the time they talked about uh, the there were like 7000 games per year coming out on steam and mm -hmm. a lot of the uh, indie studios would be hit or miss like there were no in between and uh, by the, just by the numbers themselves, like uh, uh, it's harder to get a hit and be uh, recognized uh, when you release a game. Right. Uh, even if the game is good, it cannot it can uh, not get the visibility it needs and just mm. end up being forgotten uh, too fast. Right. So uh, we thought we're gonna play. There's like the big pool and the big uh, party house, but we're gonna play in the small pool uh, behind and uh, with the small uh, dog house and like <laughs> try to make games in that uh, area. I was not expecting that analogy, but I really like it. That's cool. So you're in like the the pool party house. Um, that that's that's really cool. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, I guess the best way to explain sort of, I really what I really like is is you guys adjusted really well to room scale for that first game. But maybe I guess maybe it's better that you explain it to to the listeners. Yeah. Um, a bit about Prison Boss and why you guys were really good at. at you know, using room scale effectively for that game. Yeah, uh, what we did with Prison Bus is like uh, the first limitation of VR is uh, the the fact that uh, you have the headset, but it's tethered to your computer or your PlayStation console with a cable that's mm -hmm. generally about three to five meters long. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're playing inside, so like you're constrained by the walls in your room and like just the space in your living room or your 
your office space. So we thought uh, a lot of the games uh, back then were using teleportation as a way of moving around the space. And it still is, in a way, the most comfortable, uh, the easiest way like to move somebody virtually. Because people, have, if you move yeah, the environment around them without mm them actually moving like they would get motion sick similar mm -hmm. to like what would happen if you're in a boat moving on the waters and you can't see the water like you yeah. then get the motion sickness um so we thought we're not going to do teleportation and we're not going to do artificial movement at all we're going to just assume the fact that we're in a room and we thought in what context <laughs> Does somebody is always in the same room? And we thought, let's do a game in prison. But like, <laughs> really, it's not a game about the prison. Like, yes. uh, it's a game about uh, crafting and trading. Like, you buy <laughs> materials. You're kind of doing contraband, like Shawshank Redemption uh, sort yes. of stuff, where like yeah. you're yeah. just a trader in the prison cell in the yeah. prison environment. Yeah. And it's a uh, very lighthearted in the way we did the art and everything. But we tried to focus on our strengths, which we. It, being three students in game design, like we hoped we had good game design ideas. So we mm -hmm. kind of assumed that, but like knowing we didn't have a, a team of artists with us, uh, we were just finishing up our degree and like we ended up working with uh, friends of friends and like uh, having, trying to find uh, artists that we could hire and work with uh, easily with our limited resources. Mm -hmm. uh, so we kind of decided to have the characters be egg-like, uh, yeah, egg-shaped, egg -shaped, yeah, yeah. which we yeah. thought maybe we can do eggs, <laughs> like <laughs> assuming we, we didn't find anybody to do our art, like we could do yeah. eggs, I guess. Yeah. And uh, so that's kind of like, like the, the game itself is just an, uh, a pinnacle of all the constraints and trying to like uh, make them all fit together. And like the, the having the prison team is really just trying to work with the constraint of the headset itself, which is like you're, you're in a room, like what are you going to yeah. do? And like uh, it's something that helped a lot because some VR games, uh, even if you have the way to teleport yourself, like if you have like, let's say a, two meter by two meter or 10 foot by 10 foot uh, space. Yeah. And you're playing like a shooter where you can teleport to uh, move around in the world space. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you're in your space and you move around. Even if you have quite some space to like turn and shoot and use your arms, like uh, uh, you're kind of going to lose track of where you are and you're going to hit a wall. And as soon as you start hitting your walls, it's kind of like a... Uh, uh, a glass ceiling. I don't know. Uh, like you, you start to like say, "Oh, okay, I need to stop moving so much, and I need to like stop turning." And in the end, you start playing VR with your hands and your arms tied to your chest, and you're kind of like not moving at all. And uh, we thought prison bus. Uh, something we learned that wasn't the intent really is like since uh, the room adapts to the size of your. Uh, to your space yeah the walls in the game are at the same place where you would have your world walls in real life, real life so yeah. there's kind of this freedom of movement there's no disconnection between like i'm not gonna hit a wall because it's also yeah. the wall of my cell so like people move a lot in the game even though ironically they're in a prison cell they're in prison cell yeah and and it's cool because you see the guards like you know walking around and then you're like you're rolling cigarettes but you gotta you gotta like quickly really hide everything because if you get spotted, then it's it's no bueno, right? So so yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was really cool functionality. Um, I, uh, for the for sake of time, I'll, I'll move on to the next game. But I really yes. thought Prison Boss was really cool, and and you, you guys are still selling that game today. It's still it's still yes, uh, yes. It can be downloaded on Steam and everything. So that it's it's a yes. Now it's testament to the, yeah, yeah, go ahead. yeah. I was gonna say it launched like a week founded the studio with it. It launched on Steam on in August 2017. Mm -hmm. And we ended up doing a PlayStation VR version that came out in December 2018. And mm -hmm. we just recently, in December, last December, three months ago, we released on the Oculus Quest, which is like mm -hmm. the uh, newer, uh, the newest uh, headset at the moment. And the good thing about the Quest and Prison Bus is that there's the Quest uh, has no cable. You can plug it to your computer and play it, but the game is uh, supported like on a standalone version on the Quest. So like nice. in that idea of freedom of movement, like you're uh, really free. 
yeah, you're really free. You can turn around 30 times and like, yeah, it's still going to be okay. Like, yeah, because otherwise there's like this gymnastic of trying to manage your cable, which is, you know where it is by how it touches you when you play. But like, mm-hmm. it's a bit uh, a relief when you played so much with cables to have uh, this quest experience for Prison Bus. Yeah. And uh, this brings us into sort of the next project that you guys started working on, uh, Jousting Time. And, and for the sake of, of the people who are watching right now, I'll just play the, the Kickstarter uh, trailer and, and you could take a little water break in the, in the meantime. Hi, I'm Vaisa, CEO of Tribuche. Jousting is fun, but nowadays, who has the time to go to the stables on weekdays? <laughs> Nobody! That's why we created Jousting Time. With Jousting Time, you can now joust from the comfort of your home when the f*** you want. What time is it? Jousting Time! Bullseye! Now that is what I call jousting. Fantastic lance work, lords and ladies. Yeah, VR is cool. However, we thought it was kind of sad that people without headset could not be part of the hype. We wanted to create some sort of super experience that would bridge the gap between the immersive VR world and the common folk. We have a winner, lords and ladies! Justin, you ask? Justin Time is an online multiplayer VR justin game that allows spectators to be part of the joust. In VR, choose your favorite weapon, fight intense duels to the death, and set the crowd on fire with your sick moves. As a spectator, you can connect to the game of your friend or your favorite streamer and cheer or troll as you please. Whoa! Whoa. Well done, dude! In jousting time, either you joust or you feast. When players are not fighting each other in the arena, they will be gathered in every lord's castle to have a good time. The feast will act as the hub world from which you can defy other players. If you do not want to compete, you can just enjoy the party, eat some roasted boar, and bully the servants. No- <laughs> I get a kick out of that trailer so many times. So, I mean, I have thousands of questions here. But first, where did you film this? And like, you're a small VR game company. Like, how did you get horses? And like, the location yeah. setting. And man, how did you do really? all that? <laughs> that was kind of a. I was a, the thing is, I working in cinema in the past. I had friends like in only this, and I had like, and I thought. I'm going to collaborate with them and do the best uh, VR uh, Kickstarter there there was. And like, uh, the thing is, it kind of backfired in a way. Like the the campaign, the Kickstarter campaign was a, a big failure, like probably our biggest fra- failure ever. And like mm-hmm. uh, the uh, some people, like some of the comments we had were like, they could have made their money. Uh, they could have made their game instead of paying so much for that trailer. And like... <laughs> And but it, I don't think you. But you, you didn't pay that much for the for the trailer. I think I he was technically. I'd say like knowing like how production. Like I think it's something that would have probably uh, be worth something like twenty to thirty thousand dollar to make this mm-hmm. sort of trailer. Yeah. But it ended up costing us like six thousand dollars or something like that. Wow. Uh, and wow. like uh, some of the the people that were uh, everybody got paid. Uh, yeah. Some people uh, were paid uh, less than they normally get because they were friends of mine, and like they'd say, "Okay, I can make this," and it was kind of fun also to see how that unfolded in the end. Mm. Uh, but like, yeah, it was it wasn't uh, all voluntary work and stuff. But like, uh, we had the uh, the girlfriend of uh, somebody uh, I'm working with in the game development is really into horses, and like uh, she had contact with a uh, horse trainer and like so i ended up uh, uh, shooting one day with the horse we filmed everything in three days and like we filmed uh, <laughs> all of the parts that are kind of in the medieval village they were filmed yeah. at the bicolin uh, it's kind of like a big uh, larp uh, the biggest okay. larp in quebec okay. uh, so we had contacts with the people at bicolin as well okay so it was like just trying to get uh, everybody who may be inclined to work with us and like give us a hand like mm. to uh, join together like uh, but in the end we used all of our 
IOU or like uh, we we couldn't do <laughs> yeah. a second Kickstarter trailer in that uh, same way. Yeah, you, you cashed them all in for that that single <laughs> one. Yeah, and but yeah. you know, going back to the game itself, what I really like it's it's one of those VR games that it's not just the two players jousting. It's you know the the, the idea was that the people around could actually interact. They could cheer in real life, but also like you know if they had like a, a touch screen, they could like throw tomatoes or something or, you know, kind of have be part of the, of the experience. And yeah, that's cool yeah. because you don't hear that about VR. You know, you usually have a picture of a guy putting a helmet and he's screaming, but you're just kind of like looking at the screen of what he's doing and you're kind of like dissociated. Yes. And that's something we really wanted to, uh, to change with that title. And like, uh, the thing is uh, the Kickstarter itself was, a. Uh, uh, very not uh, working right. I think it's like VR Kickstarters. They, historically, we looked at what was done and like it didn't mm -hmm. work well. But like w trying it, uh, we went at Pax East and uh, we we rented like we tried to do things in a very uh, grandiloquent way. So like we we took a big. 10 by 20 boot, which cost us as much as doing the the Kickstarter the itself. Yeah. yeah. And like in the end, like by chance, the 10 by 10 boot right beside us, the people like canceled. And like, because the organizers didn't want to have like a hole in their planning, they said, would you be able to like extend your boot to a 10 by 30? So like we looked having like this huge thing and we built saddles and like the thing is like, playing we got the two people playing one against each other in yeah. front of the crowd that was kind of in a lineup and it really worked like the nice. the experience of people watching the players and like cheering and like connecting yeah. with the app uh, the app itself was uh, not that fun but like people were surprised to see like oh and i can connect and like uh, because we didn't ended up uh, doing the uh throwing tomatoes uh, these were all part of like what we would have done Ideas. if we got the kickstarter funded <laughs> yeah. at that point on, the only thing people could do was like to vote for the weapon draft and uh, mm -hmm. send emojis which would like show similar to like a facebook live stream you'd have the emojis uh, pass along the screen and like mm -hmm. for the since the vr players can't see what's going on on the tv screen we had the the npcs in the crowd raise like big signposts with the emojis <laughs> on it and like that so like the awesome. players would see what people were thinking <laughs> of what they were doing <laughs> to, uh, to the crowd but yeah, like yeah. voting in the weapon draft like no no player ever like tried to listen to what people would say like uh, pick the sword or pick the lance like they don't care at all they just pick whatever <laughs> they want to use so like all of this was uh more yeah. cosmetic than anything uh, in terms of the interaction, but we really felt like we had something that worked because the people that played had been in the line, like uh, looking at the others. So like by looking at the others while you wait, they kind of understood what they could be doing in the game. Mm -hmm. And especially when people were kind of hyped, like they would, uh, it would like fuel itself in a virtuous uh, circle where like they would get yeah. on the saddles and they'd start to say like Rah! and cheer at the crowd because they wanted to be yeah. like a big showman uh, themselves yeah. they so like it would to... hype the following players to like yeah. say oh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna be up there and i'm gonna do it like uh, so the, there was kind of this thing that happened and we thought that's a big spectator game like it works very well yeah. uh, so that's why we ended up uh, because of the Kickstarter that didn't work out and uh, doing the, the PAX uh, demo there, we kind of saw the potential of it. And like uh, we thought, oh, we're going to make it in the arcade uh, spectrum, like the LBE arcade. There's all of this aspect of having, if you want to start an arcade, like you would buy VR headset, plug them mm -hmm. in computers, make it into some sort of a theme park uh, within your your yeah, uh, retail something, store and like something you couldn't do at home with your your pc computer essentially uh, because exactly now you'd have the whole like ambiance and stuff and i exactly, think you, yeah you and alex i think you guys both went i think maybe with another employee uh to japan and korea afterwards where you had saddles there and you actually toured a couple of these lbvr uh these location yeah. these vrs how was that how did that go the thing is like we uh, we, uh, when we were at PAX, that's where we got the the contact to go in Korea afterwards. Okay. Because uh, 
I, we were all kind of starting out. And I mean, there, there's always like first for everything, but I was very right. happy because it was the first time that I talked to someone through an interpreter when I was okay. at PEX. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> okay. And I, and I realized after talking to the interpreter a bit that actually the person making decision was like the very short lady that was just beside <laughs> and like, because he was telling her stuff and she was telling him stuff and he was talking to me. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, okay, so I'm going to now look at her instead of look at him. And like, uh, <laughs> but they were basically inviting us to be part of their uh, indie game summit, which is called the Busan uh, Indie Fest. Okay, and so like, in uh, yeah, in Busan. And uh, the organizers and everybody doing this uh, festival, like they were very great. And like we heard good things about it, that it's kind of somewhere that's well uh, perceived in the industry, but not really well known by like, because the Korean market is not uh, that big for a foreign developers like us going into the Korean market. Mm -hmm. But we always thought like, oh, we're hearing this these good things about the experience but we're VR, like doing VR, how is that different? Like, are we gonna be like a smash it or like uh, what's gonna come out of it? And uh, uh, because we always heard things about like how the growth of VR, especially in the LB environment, like was uh, a bit bigger in the, in the uh, East Asia. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, doing the, the the event itself was very nice. Uh, we didn't end up like signing any contracts, uh, but we discussed with, uh, we did in fact sign up one contract, but nothing that was very uh, huge in the end. But the experience itself was really something to like be part of this kind of festival. And like, it's kind of like, we felt like we were the rock stars of that thing where we're like, uh, <laughs> we're all nerds and geeks, like, uh, but it really felt like it. <laughs> Yeah, it felt special, and it, that, that, that's really cool. And and I, I remember reading all of your blog posts about it, and it was it was exciting to see that you know you had this product that um, you had it as a more of like a somebody to do it at home. But like the more you saw people interact in these big social settings, the more you realize maybe this is actually more for arcades and and for bigger settings actually, and mm -hmm. and that's really cool. Um, yeah, moving on to to the more recent project, uh, Winds and Leaves. Uh, you you spoke about it earlier. It's set to launch uh, this spring. What can you tell us about the game uh, right now? Um, the game uh, we announced it like a, a month ago at early February, but like mm -hmm. a, it's gonna come out exclusively for the PlayStation VR, and uh, it's a game like it's an exploration simulation game. Uh, where you kind of have to change the way uh, the land is around you by mm -hmm. planting trees. Like we were inspired by the Canadian, it's like a co-production between France and uh, Canada uh, called The Man Who Planted Trees, okay. uh, which was uh, made by Frédéric Bach. Like he's a world-renowned animator. Uh, he died a few years ago, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, it's it won an Oscar that year for like the best animated film in 1987, nice. and the man who planted trees. It's such a good film. Like it's a 30 minute piece, and like you see how like a um, uh, a man who kind of lost uh, to uh, sickness is a uh, wife and only child. Like decides to live recluded, secluded in the kind of the uh, something that would be like the Alps. Uh, and he just plants a hundred trees every day. Like and he thought, mm. I'm gonna try to do something of my life. And like, he lives alone. And the thing in the storyline is that the people living around these villages, it kind of happens between the 1930s and 1950s. Like they think it's a miraculous forest that sprung out of nothing. And then uh, life comes back to it. Like uh, rivers uh, uh, start to flow back, uh, animals come back, people like, it was kind of a desolated region of the France landscape. And like, uh, then mm -hmm. you have young families settling in and you see all of this change that was uh, created by one man that just decided to plant trees. So we thought we're gonna make a game, a VR game where you can plant trees and it's gonna be the main thing of it. And like, you're kind of a, it's technically like a, nothing is really cl clear in the, the game, but like we inspired yourself as if you're kind of a half man, half bird kind of being where like yeah. you uh, you move around on stilts. Uh, mm -hmm. That's an, an idea we had to kind of uh, talking about the motion sickness motion of sickness. VR here. Yeah. Like it, it helps to like have less of a motion sickness feel if you like 
kind of emulate the kind of movement you'd, you'd be doing by uh, walking around. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the game itself is like about bringing life back to a region in more of a mystical uh, fantasy kind of setting where you're yeah. kind of alone in that uh, environment. Yeah, it's 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 you know, I, I tried to say not, it's not, I tried to stop saying it's cool on my podcast, but it's really cool. And <laughs> um, uh, I, Thanks, I, it, it, it reminds me of a, a game I, play, I used to play with my friend on PS3 called Flower, where uh, the goal of the game wasn't necessarily to defeat a, a an enemy or whatever, but I think the developers, their, their, their goal was to arouse positive emotions in the player. And you just like, you're the wind and you just hit the petals of the flowers and then you unlock like the beauty of the yeah. land and it, it do you think that vr has has even more power to arouse positive emotions than just like a screen game i i think so like moving into the the next generations of vr as well i think we're gonna see great things uh going in that spectrum i feel like there's the way we decided to do our take on vr was to just try and bring new ideas to the table and propose different kinds of experiences and like we see it's a a lot of the games that sell a lot and, it, and it's a good thing because like developers need to be able to make a living and like it has to have some sort of market presence but like it, there's a lot of shooters and action sports game because those are instinctively the first thing you think about doing by if you were to use your body you want to try and aim a gun or like right. uh, to use an arrow, bow and arrow or a, and but we thought there's like this uh, this feeling of presence uh, in the, the VR that you can really try to create and like try to use it for more of a contemplative or positive feeling. We thought like we'd want our players like to come back from work uh, and think maybe I'm gonna play like 20 minutes of Winds and Leaves, like yeah. make my plants grow, see my forests, and uh, before I make dinner or. Uh, so like we wanted it to be like yeah. this sort of like break from maybe the strain of uh, the yeah, stress of uh, everyday life and mm -hmm. uh, propose something that's positive. But at the same time, we we're, we're really careful to try and not market it as a meditative game because there's like also a, it's another niche of VR where you would uh, if those are sometimes not as much games as they are like just art scapes and environments where you would put the insets and do just uh breathing right. exercises and this sort of stuff but yeah these there are is puzzles this, that uh, you need yeah you have to solve the puzzles right and yeah game. for so us it's, it's really a game uh, yeah. like it appeals to the the gamer senses of like mm -hmm. you start to understand oh i can't plant this tree here because i can see the colors are different and the way the mm -hmm. the, the environment looks and the way you the way you start to understand the the world around you like down to like the 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 simplest of its mechanics if you take out all of the joy of uh, you can actually like speed up time to get your trees moving and like if you take out all of this it's more of a puzzle game in a way where you try to like understand and create the good uh, seeds uh, for every um, for every region of uh, the the in game world mm -hmm. uh, but what uh, strikes people is the the joy of seeing things you've planted grow mm -hmm. and like it, it was actually kind of a challenge and uh, trying to get people to understand the goals and things they have to do in the game to progress because sometimes they get so caught up in just planting some trees and making them grow and feel satisfied like uh, and we thought we kind of have to get them to go to the next level <laughs> but uh, there's this uh, challenge uh, in that sense, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, we we're working on uh, those sort of things, and we're very excited to see how it's gonna come out. That's cool. Um, so, you know, uh, on your LinkedIn profile, there was a quote that caught my attention, and uh, you say, you wrote, "I am like a well-oiled machine that's built around one sequence order: think, talk, act." Um, <laughs> have you always uh, lived by those worlds? <laughs> <laughs> I. Maybe I don't remember writing this. I thought I was get, <laughs> trying to get hired at some place, but <laughs> all right, that's good. That's great. <laughs> that's that's a good good answer, by the way. Um, but more more even more so on the on the planting seeds and grow. Um, when we first met, I think Trebuchet was six or eight employees, and now you guys are twenty. Um, 
uh, how's the growth been? And, and do you find it's harder to lead a, a bigger team now, especially with everybody um, remote? Yeah, I feel like the the growth has been difficult, and one of the biggest challenges of developing Wits and Leaves has been to manage like the teams. You have new faces and people that weren't there when you started, like uh, mm -hmm. building the game, and they can wonder why we're not doing it that way. And maybe mm -hmm. the way they're proposing was tried before, maybe not. Like so, there's like all of this thing that was yeah, uh, harder that. to manage. Yeah. And uh, but in the end, now we're in a really good place. Uh, we kind of ended up. Uh, starting to work uh, with uh, uh, some developers with more experience that can uh, help foster the uh, the other people in the team. And now everybody's just like working so well, like the well oiled machine I'd say now is Trebuchet, <laughs> it's not me, but like. <laughs> that's, that's a very, that's a very good CEO right now. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> good, nice, nice words, man. And but I'm um, thinking, uh, yeah, yeah I, just to, to finish up on that, like you were saying, like, uh, is it hard to, uh, because of the pandemic, like some of the, I think about five of those uh, 20 people we've never worked with in the offices. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of being scared of like when we're going to come back to the offices and have like a full team meeting. And I'm mm -hmm. going to kind of, uh, not bad trip, but like be like, oh shit, there's so many people. I'm kind of a shy person by nature and like <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be uh, freaking out a bit. But like uh, we're looking forward to it uh, very nice. much. Uh, but to see do, those faces. Do they know that one of the benefits is uh, uh, extra sandwiches at at the office? Yeah, do, yeah. They, <laughs> it's more of a legend now. Like, it's uh, more of a legend. <laughs> yeah, okay. and I recently so. saw there uh, there was like a startup that was bought by by what company was it bought? But I, I just saw it on the Verge, and it's like a salad making machine where you would pop in 30 ingredients like a uh, fresh salmon and it's all refrigerated and you would choose your ingredient and it would make you a custom dress uh, all dressed up salad and i was like the next gen sandwich machine needs this kind of uh, this kind of uh, tech uh, tech machine to make all of those sandwiches for all of those people like uh, but yeah the sandwich machine uh, we're very much looking forward to it being back, but it's kind of going to be the last thing that we're going to be able to because it involves people like passing around like yes. food and like touching all of this. Yeah. Um, I know we, you spoke a bit about like where you see uh, the VR. Do you think there's the, you know, VR is still very much considered a niche. I mean, back when I sort of worked um, with Happily, it was, I think, 1% of games on Steam were VR uh, sales, yeah. were VR sales. Do you think you think there's there's a growth there there might be a growth outside of that niche and what about that those location bases do you think after the pandemic there's really because like you know jousting time was a perfect experience of something that could be actually really great for that type of environment um, do you think mm -hmm. there might be a, a future for these these types of things? Uh, we're kind of more in the approach of wait and see like yeah. uh, but like we're not trying that much to compare it with the rest of the. Game. the medium uh, but yeah. like the thing is like when you look at stats for all of these steam accounts and all of these playstation accounts like uh, you look at steam and i believe like i saw the stat a few years ago but like it was something like the average game owned by account was at between one and two like uh, mm. and that doesn't necessarily represent all of the my friends that are gamer where like the library right. is somewhere they can it's get huge. lost yeah. in like uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so if the average is one and two how many of those accounts are just empty or not used yeah. or whatever so like mm. and there was this statistic similar to it I, I i learned about it in 2018 so it probably changed but like there was this similar statistic on playstation where like the number of games owned by playstation account was exactly that between one and two and oh. if you chop that and only filters uh, playstation accounts that had a vr headset the average was at six which is like huge oh, wow. kind of like compared to the other so like there is this aspect of like the niche but it's a niche that is actively playing those games and it yeah. wants uh, content and wants to discover new things and i feel like the playstation uh, brand and the playstation audience they they always catered to like this hunger for novelty, like Flower that you mentioned. Like it was uh, made for PlayStation to demonstrate the uh, six-axis tracking of their controller. controller. Like, uh, yeah, and like uh, you controlled by moving the the controller, and it was very innovative. And like, there's always been this culture of 
trying to make new things. So we thought we had a good fit since it's kind of how we see how we want to make VR games uh, our, ourselves. So uh, that kind of uh, made things easier when we had discussions with them and wanted to talk about concepts and gaming in general. That's awesome. Um, listen, Vesa, uh, we're about to wrap it up. I have, I have one more very brief question. It's, uh, you know, you work a lot with a lot of people, whether they be in the VFX or, you know, multimedia, whatever. But um, if people want to, you know, pitch a project with you, uh, what's the best way they can reach you? I don't know. I'd say maybe <laughs> an email. Like I'm a very, uh, I, I do my emails like a okay. religion. And uh, so I and <laughs> you have a better sleep. chance by trying to con contact us by email. But like I'd say, generally speaking, the best way is like by meeting in person. And like uh, uh, a good thing for us is that if we were given the opportunity to meet in person in the last year, we'd mm. have been absent and we'd be focusing on developing winds and leaves. Like mm -hmm. now we're kind of wrapping up the development. And if there were events back again, like we'd be able to attend and that would be also a good way to uh, introduce <laughs> ideas or start to talk about the cool. next things for uh, VR and the industry in general. And and uh, to just a lead up question to that, uh, when you know this pandemic is over, do you are you guys going to be back at like MIGs and and those kind of more local events for the gaming industry? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Uh, okay, like okay. it's uh, super important for us to like uh, to be in connection with the local community and also nice. the going at GDC this sort of stuff. But uh, for me, the the most important thing at MIGs and Mega is like uh, seeing those young people that kind of look to what they could be doing in their future and showing yeah. them that there is like an industry that's uh, flourishing in the games uh, medium where there's art there's like technical programming like for all of the kind of a, a for a lot of people i can think about how they think how they could be a good fit there's like a place for them and game development software development so like uh, mm -hmm. it's very something that i i want to be there for those future generations and make sure we keep making great games. That's, that's, they saw you're, you're a very a source of inspiration. And, and I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I can't wait to see uh, the game released. I will be trying it out. You uh, have my word on that. And uh, I'm really excited to see uh, how things come. Uh, so thank you so much for coming, man. Thanks, Philip. Uh, it was a pleasure to come and chat with you. All right. Good luck with the final uh, sprint, man. You, you guys are going to do it. I mean, you're going to do it great, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.